Okay, so we've looked at the general question of how we might move from a broad question to a specific hypothesis. Now our next step in the scientific method is to actually collect our data. And within psychology, there are a lot of different methods that are available to us. We're not going to go over every single one of them in this video, but we will go over some of the more common ones. Having said that, the first one I'm going to show you is actually not that common, uh, and this is called a case study. So a case study is when you are studying one person in great depth. And the main reason that you would usually want to do that is you want to study somebody who is in unusual circumstances. So maybe because they are famous, maybe because they've got symptoms that are just very unusual. Uh, there was an article published uh, a number of years ago about a woman who was experiencing picture within picture visual hallucinations. So if you actually think of a TV that has picture within picture, she was only having hallucinations in one portion of her visual field. Even by the standards of hallucinations, that is just odd. And so you're not gonna sit around and wait till you get tons of people who have this symptom. You're going to study this one woman simply because you can. Now, the other reason you might use a case study is sometimes you're studying either one person or a very small group, and you just wanna get much richer data than you can with a brief survey or a brief interview. So maybe you have someone who agrees to be interviewed every week for a year or something like that so that you can really learn a whole lot more about their life and about their behavior. But there are downsides here. First of all, people are human. So they lie because they don't want to tell you embarrassing things. They forget stuff. They remember things wrong. Then you throw in the fact that the researcher, they're human. And so they have certain assumptions and certain expectations. And that might affect the questions that they ask, as well as the way that they interpret the results. And then finally, it's hard to generalize, generalize, excuse me, to the larger population. It's really interesting to read about these visual hallucinations, but that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about how visual, how vision works under normal circumstances. Our next method is naturalistic observation. You're just observing real life behavior. So this is where in my head, I always picture narrators from nature documentaries. Here we see the snow leopard in its natural habitat, right? This is what we're doing with humans. We're going out and we're measuring what they actually do. And so the advantage, of course, is that it's real life behavior. They can't lie about what they've done because you just watched them do it. However, the big limitation is, first of all, people will clearly change their behavior if they know they're being observed. I realize reality TV is not research, but think about it. Everybody knows that people on reality TV shows are not behaving completely naturally. They know that they're being watched, they know they're on TV, and it's going to change their behavior, whether they intend it to or not. Second thing is that when you're out watching people, you don't know who they are. You see what looks like a woman behaving kind of oddly with her kid. Maybe it's not her kid. Maybe she's the well-meaning aunt who just doesn't know how to deal with kids. Or maybe it looks like the mom is giving that five-year-old way too much freedom because really it's a very short nine-year-old. You don't know anything about these people. From a practical standpoint, you can't see people's thoughts. So anytime you want to know about people's opinions or their knowledge, you have to ask them. You can't just sit and watch them. Uh, and then for ethical and also for legal reasons, you are limited to public behavior. So if you want to know about married couples' sex lives, the police frown upon you putting a camera in their bedroom. You need to survey them instead. Yes, they might lie, but it's legal and it's a whole lot less creepy. Next, we get the survey method, which is by far the most common method used uh, in psychology research. And by survey, this can be anything. It can be a 
web survey, an online survey, a questionnaire, a test, anything where you're just asking people for information. And the reason it's used so much is it's really quick and cheap, right? You can post a survey online and get tons of data. This is not always the case. Uh, if you need to do in-person interviews, for example, that's gonna take more time and cost more money, but it is often fast and cheap. It also has the advantage of being potentially anonymous. Now, this is more important for some surveys than others. If I was to walk up to some of you on the street and just say, hey, do you prefer vanilla ice cream or chocolate? Most of you would have no problem sharing that answer because who cares? No one's going to run around and be like, ew, vanilla lover. So that's fine. But if you're asking people about their sex lives or their political beliefs or um, their history of drug use, for obvious reasons, people may not want to share that information if they think it's going to get out. And so they may be more likely to participate if they know that their data is going to be anonymous. The downside, your data is only as good as your answers, meaning sometimes you realize after the fact that you worded a question weird or they give you an answer that just makes no sense and you're stuck with what you've got. Another potential limitation is that anytime someone is asked to evaluate another person, they tend to give very global ratings. So for example, at the end of the semester, you're going to fill out a student opinion form and evaluate me. Odds are good if you like me, you're gonna rate me high on everything. And if you don't like me, you'll rate me low on everything. Even though in reality, there's no reason I couldn't be say nice and friendly, but also be disorganized, people usually don't distinguish. They give all good ratings or all bad ratings. Next method is archival research. So this is using existing records. Uh, so for example, the college does this all the time. We have all sorts of data on each of you. When did you first enroll at the college? Uh, what were your test scores coming in? What was your high school GPA? All those kinds of things. And so the advantage is we have lots of data uh, and it's fairly inexpensive because the data is already there and all it's really costing is your time and energy to interpret that data. Um, but one big downside is that you have no control over the data quality. So particularly when you are looking at older data sets, um, if you have data that was collected on paper, records may have been lost over time, ink fades, somebody had messy handwriting, there may be all these problems that you have no control over. Um, but one example of where you might see archival research just in your day-to-day -day lives is customer loyalty cards. So places like um, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, uh, where they have a loyalty card and every time you make a purchase you earn points and when you get enough points you get you know a free coffee or whatever it is right the reason those companies like it is they're getting a ton of data from you so not just how much coffee do you buy at starbucks but things like what days of the week do you usually shop what times of day what are your preferred drinks uh, if they send you a coupon by email on Sunday, what are the odds that you're going to use it on Monday? And are you more likely to respond if it comes in email or if it comes from the app on your phone? So they are getting tons of data from you. Of course, you might get free coffee. You might not mind that, but this is why they're doing it. And then finally, the last method we're going to look at is experiments. And the key feature that makes something an experiment is that you are manipulating one variable to see how it changes another. And the reason you would do this is it is the only method that lets us definitively determine cause and effect. Other methods can absolutely give us big giant clues, but they are not considered definitive evidence. Um, but again, there are downsides. One is that sometimes it's too artificial. Uh, depending on whether you're collecting data in a lab versus in the real world, 
you've got a trade-off. You have more control in a lab, but it also doesn't necessarily mimic real life quite as well. Uh, and the other concern is that some variables cannot be manipulated, either for practical reasons. So for example, we cannot make people be Christian or be male or be heterosexual, or for ethical reasons. Uh, if I want to know how young children are affected by the death of a parent, technically a true experiment would require taking a group of kids, some of them I let their parents live, other ones I kill their parents and see what happens. Technically it's possible, but just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. So a better way to gather that data would be to find kids whose parents have already died and interview them. So it's still sad, but for obvious reasons, it's uh, more ethical. That's it for now. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask, and I hope you all have a great day.